Well, hello and welcome to the Broadcast Revolution headquarters, uh, right alongside the BBC's Broadcasting House on Portland Place in London. I know several hundred of you are gradually joining us remotely. We're live streaming this event today from our HQ. So thank you for joining us, whether you're at home or at the office at the end of a warm, hot London day. Uh, my name is Mike Young. I joined Broadcast Revolution a little over a year ago after 20 odd years at the BBC, largely at Radio 4 and at Radio 5 Live. Um, and I did a bit of local radio as well. And it was in local radio that I first came across our guest today. Uh, and that is Louisa James. Uh, she was at BBC Radio Leicester in those days. Uh, I was at Radio Nottingham. There was a degree of competition. Uh, and then moved through local television news, a bit of central. Yeah, bit of ITV Central. Bit of ITV Central. And then 2010, 2011, off you went to national ITV. And I suppose the dying embers of GMTV that then became Daybreak and that then has now become Good Morning Britain. That's right. Various uh, incarnations of Daybreak that we called Purple Daybreak, Yellow Daybreak and Orange Daybreak. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was purple at the start, mm. wasn't it? Which was not a very breakfasty colour. No. When Adrian Childs was, was anchoring it. It was a whole new world. It was. It, was it, it took a while to kind of change. But then GMTV in its day was wildly successful. You were joining, you know, something really quite great there. Um, Daybreak struggled. GMB seems to have recovered a lot of the ground that maybe was lost. Um, royal correspondent you've been for GMB in your time, yeah. or at least the, the one they turned to for royal news. You were outside hospitals when various babies were coming. That was, that was the start of it. I was outside the hospital when baby George was born. And I think I was sent because the, the, the woman who was covering it was ill. So I was sent <laughs> to cover her and I literally then didn't go home for about three weeks. So I think he was very late, wasn't he? And we, we pretty much camped outside there for three weeks. Did you have grumpy Simon McCoy from the BBC alongside <laughs> you going, there is no news? Yes. Uh, I, rem I remember that very it, well. It was such a treat though. And actually then they cottoned on to that whole thing of journalists coming outside and for subsequent babies, we weren't allowed to anymore. <laughs> so it was great fun. Yeah. Well, and a, and a linchpin, a historical moment mm. happening as well. I should say a couple of points of order. If you'd like me to ask a question, of Louisa today, you can do so via our Twitter account. Uh, that is at Broadcast Revo. So at Broadcast Revo, please tweet in your question and we'll try and read that out for you. Uh, you can ask a question or join the chat as well using the hashtag join the broadcast revolution. So join the broadcast revolution is the hashtag for this one. Uh, by the way, everyone who asks a question automatically gets entered into a quarterly draw for a free broadcast for good campaign. Now this is where we'll deliver uh, a free campaign to a charity of your choice on your behalf. Uh, we'll draw that towards the end of this month. So if you send us a question, you'll go into that draw. Um, Louisa, let's, let's start off focusing with your current role. You are now the new political correspondent mm. for Good Morning Britain. So a large amount of your time is spent at horrible o'clock at 10 Downing Street. Yes, I get up at three o'clock in the morning, which is delightful. Um, and then I get to Downing Street or sometimes uh, just by the House of Parliament for about um, five past five. And then I broadcast throughout Good Morning Britain, which starts at six and goes until um, just before nine. OK. Um, I think you've taken on that role uh, at a surprisingly interesting time mm -hmm. because you think, OK, Brexit was going to be the absolute zenith mm -hmm. and maybe things would calm down. No. Um, this is keeping you... At incredibly busy. I mean, how, how do you keep up, really? Is there ever a time you can turn you know off? What? It's really, that's one of the hardest parts of the job. It's really hard to switch off because, because of, I mean, in a great way, because of social media and podcasts and so on, you don't have to be um, stuck in front of your computer um, at specific times, which is great because I don't work, um, you know, conventional hours. It's not rolling news, GMB, in, in the way that no. some people have to cope with. Um, but, you know, there was a time when if you wanted to watch the six o'clock news, you had to sit down at six o'clock. And I can obviously, I watch news at 10, for example, at three o'clock in the morning when I get up. Got you. Um, so, but the, the, the flip side of that is that um, I feel like I walk away from Twitter for five minutes and I've, there's a thousand articles that I need to read. Um, it's very hard to spend any time kind of unplugged because I feel like I miss a lot of things, yes. especially as I'm kind of getting into the role and um, you know there are new things all the time, and I'm kind of catching up on things that that happened, you know, before I started. Also, I've got two children, and so you know I had time out to have each of the kids. And so if, for the last general election, for example, I was on maternity leave, so I was sort of reminding myself of some of the um, you know which the red wall seats were and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
it is hard to switch off. But the other great thing about GMB is that we're not on air on Saturdays and Sundays. Yes. So um, by the we finish, you know, Friday morning, and then most of us have a break until Sunday. That feels, which is really nice. Yes. Whereas breakfast TV does does exist every single day. I mean, the Today program Radio Four. Yeah. I don't think they have a Sunday edition still. No. Um, but again, it's a six day week for them, mm. so you can detach. Have you had a proper holiday yet from your role? Because I'm always fascinated. Uh, I, I know Chris Mason at the BBC, and I, I, I remember watching him working, and now political editor at the BBC, and I just think, when do you switch off? Because you, if you go away for a week, mm. the, the, the news, even during mm. the, the calmer season or the silly season, doesn't go away. Something no. can happen. Uh, it, it, it feels quite all-consuming to me. It can be all-consuming. I find it hard to switch off. And I find on Friday I have my children for the day, or one child all day and the other, you know, before and after school. And I don't, I can't, I, I literally don't have the headspace to pay attention to no. anything. Then Saturday I'm busy doing the usual, you know, ballet and whatever, all this, you know, ferrying kids around. And then on Sunday when I kind of plug back in, it takes me a day to yes. catch up on Friday and Saturday. Yeah. But, you know, none of us is indispensable. There are plenty of brilliant correspondents at Good Morning Britain who have and do cover political news um, in the past and currently when, you know, I'm off. For example, I don't work Fridays. So, right. um, you know, I think that's what we all have to remind ourselves. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, on a Sunday, what would your papers of choice be to try and get you up to speed? You're probably reading just about everything you can, I assume. Yeah. I mean, do you know, I find you say that the Today programme isn't on on a Sunday, but mm. the 8 o'clock news on a Sunday on BBC Radio 4 where they do the news and the papers is a really good yeah. starting point for the day. Um, I always watch the political shows, the, the BBC Sophie Rayworth show and, yeah. the, and the Sky um, at Sophie Ridge. And um, I mean, The Times has got a brilliant Tim Shipman in The Times. It always gives a, a, an incredible insight into um, the workings of Number 10 on a Sunday. Um, and uh, so I always read that and uh, The Telegraph and the FT. And then I kind of dip into, and The Observer actually, then I dip into the, the others, because I, I guess the other brilliant thing is I don't need to go to the shop anymore and buy yeah. um, a whole load of papers uh, because we can dip in so much more easily into articles we want to. Yeah. The other side of that is I think it's much harder to feel like you've read a paper cover to cover when you're reading them online. So sometimes yeah. I feel I miss that feeling I had when I used to pick up a Sunday paper and read it from beginning to end and feel like I'd really got a broad view. Mm. I mean, I, I follow Robert Peston on, on Twitter, mm. and I'm always amused how long his tweets are. Yeah. Can I go four or five sort of in yeah. a row or whatever? But if you're following people like you, like Robert, like Chris or whatever, it's amazing how well tuned in you are. Yeah. I just hope you all can get a breather at some point. Your previous ro roles, you've been a producer at GMB yeah. in your time for over a decade. You've been a reporter. You've fronted the program on, on occasion. Yeah. There's there's two, three presenters very often with GMB. Yeah. Um, Let's focus on production first, because yeah. I think a lot of people here are thinking, okay, you know, they might have a story or a client mm. where they'd love to get some national exposure. Mm. Um, Production-wise, uh, what is the dream guest, would you say, for Good Morning Britain? If you could conjure up a, a top three guest that you would just love to have on that programme, who would you cherry pick? Well, we have various different kind of parts of the programme, and as the programme goes on through the morning between six and nine it the focus shifts in terms of guests so uh, in the six o'clock hour the the main guests are our political uh, newspaper pundits who are often um uh, kevin Maguire yeah. and uh, andrew pierce and um that's when we kind of digest the day's news and we talk about politics and then as the show goes on i would say in the middle of hour um we tend to have more kind of news features type guests will often have a debate and then in the final hour, towards the end of the show, we have government minister and we have a celebrity. Or, or, you know, that, well, mostly it's a celebrity guest of some sort. So obviously, you know, we would love, for example, tomorrow to interview Johnny Depp or Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they're, we're, they're we're always, we want, at the moment, yeah, yeah, we want the... Ideally both. Well, Amber Heard, I just saw us um, on NBC's Today show so they've right. got her. They're, they're choosing uh, the, where they go yeah okay. But you know I think we always want the newsmakers and um, the people who everybody's talking about at the moment um, and who everybody wants to hear from um, and then we love to hear from real human people with their real human stories as well. I was, I was going to say the importance of the case study uh, I mean yeah. in, in, in my time I, I've seen sort of official chief executive levels yeah actually being phased out by a lot of broadcasters. Mm. BBC, ITV, 
across the board and it's been the rise of the real person mm. and very often you'll have a real person story is enough to actually mm. fill that void. Is that very much the case with GMB? Um, I would say less so now. I think we like, we, we might put that in our news bulletins more, but I think for the programme we like really strong um, voices that sometimes people have heard of. And so we'll often have a debate um, and we'll get two really opinionated people. And it can be anything from, you know, should Prince Andrew have walked his mother down the aisle to um, is it okay to we in the sea? Right. That was a recent one, I think. Um, and one of our reporters asked um, a few people on the red carpet, I think she was at a film premiere, and so we asked them that question as well. So, but we love nothing more than a really good debate um, to get, because that gets people going on social media and, um, and it gets people going um, in the studio. And so sometimes if there's an idea, if it can be um, framed as a debate, that might be likely to kind of pique the interest of our editors. You've been at the BBC in your sort of formative years, mm. you've crossed over to ITV. I, I sense with GMB, people can have an opinion there, mm. uh, as opposed to the BBC where maybe there has to be a mm. neutrality, well, it definitely has to be a neutrality. Yeah. Do you feel that freedom in the, in the content that GMB has? Um, again, I think there's a real distinction between news. Mm. We, we, we think of our programme as news bulletins and then kind of programme items. And in our news, we would, you know, we take that obviously very seriously and we, we adhere to all of the rules about accuracy and due impartiality and, and everything anybody else does under Ofcom rules. Um, and so in the news, no, I don't think that, you know, we as news correspondents express an opinion, except if it's in the form of some kind of analysis or commentary. Yeah. So you might say, you know, I think Tiverton and Honiton is going to be a very difficult by-election for Boris Johnson, but I don't think you mean that sort of opinion, no. do you? No. Um, in our programme, absolutely, we get opinions from pundits and also from our presenters a lot more but yeah. I don't think that's exclusive to GMB I, I certainly think we led the way w with that to an extent but then you know GB News and Talk TV are kind of predicated on that as a... I was going to ask you about those I mean it, it's fascinating because up to a point uh, I mean during the pandemic uh, Piers Morgan was there anchoring GMB and I felt was probably the number one interviewer that was scoring points at a really important time mm. for the British public in set piece interviews. Mm. Uh, and Piers Morgan has a strong opinion. Mm. Off, off he's gone to have a strong mm. opinion where he's going, uncensored. Um, GMB, I suppose, maybe is, is trying to straddle the middle ground here mm. between the BBC uh, and where Piers has gone off to. Mm. Uh, do you think that um, it's going to be hard? I, I don't think Piers Morgan's particularly been replaced by a direct successor. There's people like Adel Ray, there's people like Richard Maley. Um, how hard are those shoes to fill when you've had such a dominant presenter in place? Um, I think our, our current presenters do a great job because they're basically this similarly big personalities, mm. and then no one is Piers Morgan. Mm. Um, but we had Piers Morgan, and he and he was a great personality for our show, and now we've got other great personalities. But and I don't think that really anybody could try to be Piers Morgan, and no. nobody, and that would be a mistake um, if we tried to replace him like for like, and that's not what we're trying to do. Um, as to who replaces him in the long term, that is way above my pay grade. <laughs> but certainly our current um, crop of presenters, mm. you know, are keeping the viewing figures just as high as they were when Piers Morgan was there. You, you mentioned viewing figures. The, the way we kind of look at it when we look at the various sort of ways that the figures are measured is, is BBC Breakfast is in the lead, mm. about 1.2 million at any given moment on a programme. Mm. Maybe GMB is sitting around the 800,000, the 900,000. One senses that on, on key occasions that, that gap is almost non-existent. It's mm. narrowing all of the time. Yeah, it is definitely narrowing. I wish I could give you more accurate figures, but... It's very hard to gauge them sometimes, mm. actually, isn't it? But, but it's definitely how, how is it doing it, though? Because GMB, you sense it is really ambitious in what mm. it's trying to do, and it wants to win. It wants to be the number one. Mm. How is it going about that? What's it doing to try and get people in? Well, I think there are people who will only ever watch ITV and there are people who will only ever watch the BBC and then there's this huge floating group of viewers in the middle who, you know, in the past, I think GMTV was much more successful than the BBC and now it's uh, the BBC who are more yeah. successful than us in terms of viewing figures. I, I definitely know that our um, viewership among um, younger viewers is increasing and um, and that's a really interesting driver of, um, of viewing figures and a, and a lot of that comes through our social media team and because right. I think one of the things that we try to do when we talk about our debates and our guests is create viral moments that people might see on YouTube or on Twitter or on Instagram or on TikTok or whatever yeah. um, 
you know, and they might never have watched Good Morning Britain, but they might come to us through that. And, and certainly we are creating, focusing on creating that kind of content as well. You know, and we're not making television for TikTok, mm. but we're trying to make really interesting, sparky television that also does well as a short clip. How would you say GMB um, engages with its audience? Uh, because uh, I was chatting away with uh, a GB News producer in a previous event, and he said, actually, don't look at our viewing figures. Look mm. at our social media following. Mm. It's the way we really engage with our audience. I mean, that's something that's changed in our time working mm. for any broadcaster we've worked for. Uh, I remember when text was quite a new thing mm. for the radio studio. Um, now your audience is, is going to have a popper to present or have a popper mm. to guest or whatever. I mean, is that a healthy thing? Is it something that GMB is really embracing? I don't think, I mean, we don't read out an awful lot of viewer comments on it. We're not driven by viewer comments in the way that, you know, a phone-in show or, or, or whatever would be. But certainly, we, you know, we have people who work um, full-time, obviously, in our social media department. And, mm. and especially while we're on air, we have people constantly monitoring the reaction of people. And, and it's a good way sometimes of getting, you know, real-time uh, insight into what our viewers are thinking and which bits they're liking and which bits they're interacting with and that give us, gives us a good sense of you know to, to what extent people are enjoying what's going on or they're kind of mm. feeding off it because I, the thing about GMB is that for a lot of people it is on in the background in the morning because that's the nature of breakfast television and so I guess what we're trying to do is, is create the kind of television that makes people stop and mm. actually think they need to watch um, for a bit and sometimes you know social media is the way that we can tell that people are doing that when there's suddenly a big reaction to something or, or people are, are suddenly reacting and we absolutely encourage um, viewer interaction like that but I would say it's not you know the basis of our program in the way it is. Well, what's been fascinating people. is on the occasions where I have uh, helped a client get on GMB mm. uh, I remember on one occasion the uh, pub landlord Al Murray was on mm. talking about uh, a campaign to get more people to donate uh, to DKMS, the uh, blood cancer charity, mm. to actually be donating blood mm. platelets. Um, and they noticed a significant mm. spike after the Richard Madeley interview, which was just before seven o'clock in the morning. I mm. mean, that, that is actually where you really can actually see the result of going on. Yes, mm. you might be talking about, okay, 800,000 people are watching uh, Good Morning Britain, six and a half million are listening to the Today programme. Mm. But the kudos that comes on being on national television, mm. the retweets, it, it yeah. all feeds in. Yeah, and like I said, I think what happens then is that people will see a clip yeah. because they saw it on Twitter or they saw it on YouTube and they think, oh, maybe that's worth watching then because that's the kind of thing I'm going to get. And so that for us has been a really great way of getting in new viewers and younger viewers who mm. weren't necessarily engaging with us because I think our viewer, our average viewer is mid-50s. I was going to ask yeah. that because, I mean, it, it's always fascinating to look at the, the, the average listener. Uh, at Radio 4 on a lunchtime, it might be 60-something. Mm. By nature, it's often a retired bunch. So GMB, average age, early 50s? I think saying. it is, yeah. Male or female? Um, more female than male. And um, uh, yeah, females with um, children dependents, yeah. is, is, there is a larger proportion of, of that in our audience than male. But, but actually, it's not, I don't think it's you know, massively skewed. Um, in that way. There's a few questions coming in for you already and uh, do keep those coming in. Our Twitter account at Broadcast Revo is where you can be sending those through to or you can join the chat using the hashtag join the broadcast revolution. Let's just fire a few at you. First of all Dan and Leeds. How important is it to offer an exclusive to secure mm. a spot on GMB? We now, love an exclusive. I bet you do. Mm. And we're always trying to persuade people to give us things exclusively. I think one of the difficulties with being breakfast television is that we're often previewing something that hasn't happened yes or talking about something that happened yesterday right and that's always difficult and that's always going to be difficult with breakfast television because very little actually happens at six o'clock in the morning so if we can um that's why stories from america do so well with us because they happen overnight so yes. you know we went big on the trump but you know, we featured the trump hearings um or you know the um capital riot hearings yeah. um this morning because they happen while most people were in bed and so it's yeah. something new so you know we like content from the states for that reason um, and you know, if something is actually happening at six o'clock in the morning, that that's great for us. But it's rare, and so that's why exclusives are so good for us, because um, it is so unusual for us to be kind of first with something, because um, it's often embargoed um, to midnight the night before, mm -hmm. um, or you know later in the day. So actually, we do love an exclusive, um, and we love people you know trusting us to trusting us with that story. And and sometimes what we'll do is, and um, what I have done before is ask for an exclusive. Um, until nine o'clock. So can yeah. we have it from six till nine and then everyone else can have then it at nine? everyone else can feed off it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you've got a, 
very experienced planning team, I know, at, mm. at GMB, because a lot of people, when I was at Five Live, left to join you mm. guys because uh, they didn't want to move up to mm. Salford, actually. A lot of them had family commitments down in down south. And now you've nicked Television Centre off the BBC, and that's yeah. where you're broadcasting from. Um, when is the right time to be, be approaching that mm. planning team? Because that's a really good question. And, and, and I can only answer it from my point of view, and I don't mm. work on planning. But, you know, we have um, meetings a month ahead to look at the, the month in advance. We have the week ahead. But I would say, I, and it's really good to give people notice, um, mm. but, you know, the majority of our decisions are made in the last 24, if not 12, if not six hours before we go on air. Because we're a news programme when we're topical and we like to react to things. And, you know, I think... You, the, the danger with it going in too early is that it gets forgotten about. Yes. And also, I think it's always good to bear in mind, everybody should bear in mind that because we're a news programme, you know, it is going to happen that we will book somebody or we will say we'll do something and at the last minute we'll change our minds. Yeah. Um, how, how often out of, out of interest is does that happen, that, that somebody is lined up for, for GMB and then they're stood down on the morning? I mean, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to know because I don't work on the kind of yes, the sharp the end. Gallery, but yeah. I, I would say it does happen sometimes, but mm. it, it happens when there's breaking news mm. that we stand people down, you know, right there and then. I'd say, you know, most of the time, if we, if we need to replace an item with something else, we would be able to tell the person, you know, the day before or, or mm. even before that. But obviously it does happen because we're... When there's a really big breaking news, then we just turn into rolling news and we just have to go with whatever it is. It was another question I was going to ask you, actually, mm. because I remember sitting in midnight planning meetings where mm. I would be working with Five Live Breakfast and you sense that Breakfast TV were less willing to tear up their running order. Oh, no, we love that. Stuff. You we like to chuck it all out. Yeah. If something that, big happens, we will chuck it all out and we'll just go with that. But, you know, it has to be big. Yes. And we've had a few occasions where things have been happening, you know, awfully in real time. Um, mm. The Grenfell fire was a, was one of those very topically where you know that was happening. Um, it was just unfolding in front of our eyes while we were on air. There was also the Las Vegas shooting, um, mm -hmm. which again was happening while we were on air. Um, you know, again, time zones um, sometimes mean that it's something that's that's far away. But um, of course, in those situations, we will just yeah. check it out and go with it. Um, another question coming in here, uh, at Broadcast Revo is our Twitter account. Uh, Martin asks, with the average age, you were mentioning around 50, do GMB want to try and bring that down? What type of guests would interest a, a younger audience, for example? Um, I think we're always trying to grow our audience, you know, across the demographic. I wouldn't say we're necessarily trying to bring it down. We're just trying to, you know, um, consolidate it. Um, and, you know, the best kind of guests really have appeal across the demographic, even if somebody doesn't know who the guest is, it's our job as producers and editors and interviewers and presenters to make it interesting to whoever's watching. Um, and I suppose it's your job as PRs or whatever to pitch it to us in such a way that we can sense that we can do that with it. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily um, about you know pitching to a younger audience. It's, a, it, it's about when you're pitching to us, giving us reasons why it's going to appeal to the younger audience and the kind of, um, what do they call it at the BBC? The, um, well, replenishes is what we always yes. used to call it at the BBC. The, 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 the people you were praying would actually start tuning That's in and, and, and come through. Because I think Five Lives Average audience was late 40s. And what do we call the core? There was a word at the BBC for the kind of core audience, wasn't there? Oh, well, I, I can't remember what it there, was. There were, there were countless references. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and you know, the best guests will have appeal across... Across yes. the, you know, we talk about Love Island a lot at the moment yeah. because it's an ITV show and, you know, I think obviously our younger audience is probably more likely to be watching Love Island. Um, but I hope that we talk about it and we tell it in a way that it is interesting, yeah. even if we've never watched it, because, um, you know, it's entertaining. I mean, I, I don't watch Love Island at the moment, but I watched one of our items about it the other day and I was really entertained by it. Yes. Uh, how much does GMB kind of have to actually run stuff that is, is promoting the, the broader ITV product? Not as much as I felt we were when I was at BBC. Interesting. I think we give lots of, you know, we do a lot about Strictly, for example. Yes. Um, and I think we just talk about the shows that everyone's talking about, really. Yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone's talking about Love Island at the moment, and we, we might get some better access to Love Island or Dancing yeah. on Ice than we might to strictly so yeah. that would you know make us more inclined perhaps to do something if we're getting behind the scenes access or whatever but I think we just want to talk about the shows that people are interested in um a research question from rebecca in manchester gmb like to do a lot of their own polls says rebecca mm. do they prefer that to branded 
research? Um, you know, I think we'll take branded research, especially if it's exclusive, but I think we do like to do our own polls because, mm. you know, um, we, we like to create our own headlines and create the set the agenda. And also I think um, sometimes, you know, polls are done by a particular brand or company with a vested interest of some sort. And unless that, you know, unless we're careful with that, it can sometimes look, you know, like we're facilitating some kind of publicity or advertising, whatever, yes. of that particular brand. We have to be careful that, you know, we know that that has, I'm not suggesting that they're not, but, you know, that we know that that has been rig rigorously, rigorously carried out. And then we have to kind of um, double check it by doing our own research and so on. And so sometimes it just makes sense for us to, to yes. do it ourselves. I mean, the, the, the people watching this are going to be comms teams, PR people, press officers, that mm. sort of thing. They'll think, OK, then what place is there for a brand to be on Good Morning Britain? Uh, it, it's not a no-no by any means. No, but we do have really strict rules on it. Yeah. Um, because uh, under Ofcom and under, under product placement and so on, commercial references are very uh, limited and they are allowed in certain situations, especially you know, if we have a celebrity guest on who's promoting a book or a film or whatever, they are allowed yeah. to mention it, but they are given a limited number of mentions. Sometimes it's just the one or whatever. So I would say you know, if you worked for um, Kit Kat and you did a survey that said nine out of ten people love chocolate, you know, that's never going to get on no. because there's no kind of intrinsic value to that. Yeah. Um, often we will take, you know, if there was a really interesting survey by KitKat, um, we might take those statistics, widen it out into a bigger story, and they might get an, an on-screen mention in a graphic, for example. Right. But there are various ways rarely, to gauge success yeah. on that. And we have to run these things by our lawyers because, you know, there are very strict rules on it. I wouldn't say it's not going to happen, but I think, you know, there has to be a genuine public interest, news interest or whatever yeah. um, to run it. Or sometimes it's just something that's again, sparks a debate, you know, say it was a survey that KitKat had done about whether it's okay to wee in the sea. Yeah. We would probably make an entire item out of that. And of course we would mention KitKat maybe once or in a, in a graphic or something, yeah. but you know, that wouldn't be the point of it because... Are there any sort of general sort of themes uh, that really do fly on GB? Because I, I, I know, remember certain editors mm. had particular passions, certain presenters yeah. had particular passions, and, and actually the programme in the end slightly mirrored those passions. Yeah, and absolutely that still happens. We definitely will, you know, do things that are our presenters' passions. They will bring things to us and we will tailor shows around them. Um, so, for example, um, Martin Lewis is one of our presenters, um, sometimes as a... Um, a money expert and sometimes he presents you know co-presents our show and we did an entire three-hour show on the cost of living presented mm. by martin lewis that was tailored around him and his advice um, and then more you know less extreme examples uh focusing on some of our presenters interests so mm -hmm. um you know susanna reed uh has an interest in um military charities for example and so we've, we've sometimes featured um uh, for help for heroes or, or you know not just one charity but other other charities like that who um, she might have connections with um, that might mean that she is able to get good guests on the show you know when Piers Morgan was our presenter we had Donald Trump on the show because he had yeah. a personal connection with Donald Trump so we, we absolutely will do things that our presenters bring to us providing as ever that there's a legitimate news interest and public interest and so on for doing it. If there was to be a typical way that a, a, a brand gets on Good Morning Britain, yeah. I, I can think of examples where I've, you know, a, a story that I've worked on uh, for Broadcast Revolution has got on the air, and very often it is the celebrity route. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, I think it really pays. Voice. It pays to look at, well, it pays to look at our presenters' profiles and mm -hmm. their Twitter and all that kind of thing to see if there's something that might they might be interested in. Yeah. Um, and absolutely, you know, Al Murray talking about the, um, was it blood, blood cancer? Blood cancer, yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect example yeah. of why, you know, we might get pitched a story and, you know, we might say, and then they'll say, well, we've got this celebrity face of it. And then mm. suddenly there's a good reason for us to do it that's not, you know, we've got multiple reasons to do it, basically, so that we can talk to them about that and we can talk to them about something else. It sounds cynical, but it's basically a win-win, isn't it? Because it's often a really good story or a really good cause mm. and so they get something great out of it and we want to you know we want to give our time to causes like that but also then we get a great guest and we get to ask them other things as well. Uh, I think what's uh, fascinating I think, with, with GMB is, is the time that can be spent on, on something and, and a message can be put across in very little time. Mm. What would you say is the average length of an interview? Oh, oh, it's not long. On, on I think it depends really if it's de a debate it can be longer. Mm. Um, sometimes it's you know three minutes 
So don't don't feel that you've you know somehow been wrapped up early if it's no. a three minute interview on GMB. No, that it, that can be a typical duration. And we're always you know timing time is so <laughs> difficult for us because we've got so many junctions that we have to hit in the yeah. show. You know we've got various things that we you know regional ops ad breaks weather various competitions various things that we have to hit so um we are, we're often having to wrap up you know really important guests because you know we have to throw to lorraine or whatever so it's not a reflection on any particular guest necessarily how long you get and sometimes shorter interviews are better than longer interviews we've all had interviews that have gone on too long yes uh, <laughs> and and sometimes you don't want to let go of an interview but it but it has to be brought to an end uh, we, we talked a little bit about gmtv evolving into daybreak evolving mm. into gmb uh, tanya asks do you see the format of the show ever changing is there anything else you would like to see introduced? I suppose up to a point, this is a very tried and tested format. Mm -hmm. It's probably evolution, not revolution. Yeah, I mean, I think we're always trying new things. We're always trying new things in terms of where we place things in the show, um, you know, where we put certain guests. We look, you know, forensically at viewing figures per minute so we can see at which point in the show the paper review does well or you know the political pundits do well at which point in the review in the show our entertainment uh, section does well and is it better with you know our presenter at the desk or is it out, him out and about or you know we, we kind of test look at these things uh, well I don't um, cleverer people than I do look at these things all the time to um, you know to finesse it I suppose and I wouldn't like to say that there won't ever be a huge change in the way we do things but I think it's a funny thing breakfast television isn't it because various people and channels and all sorts have tried to evolve over the years but it always does seem to come back to fundamentally um, you know quite a familiar format what I do think GMB has done is shape that up a bit and make yeah. it a little bit more interesting and uh, the debates is a big thing M making it something that people talk about Speak, speaking purely a, as a viewer, I sense that breakfast television on BBC is, is cuddlier yeah. um, and GMB can be a bit more gutsy, a bit more challenging on occasions. Yeah, That's and I think a, a bit more unpredictable. Thing, yes. Yeah. And I think if you want to know what you're going to get, then you tune into the BBC and you're going to get you know, brilliant, a brilliant programme, um, really um, great journalists and um, you know, a very solid product. I think you're going to get all that on GMB, but you might get something you weren't expecting. Uh, Joe has uh, tweeted in, uh, are you actively looking for a Monday to Thursday co-anchor with oh, Susanna Oh, don't Reed? ask me that. I've got no <laughs> idea. I genuinely have no idea. I mean, these great, things great. are way, it's a really good question, but these things are way above my pay grade. I suppose it, you know, Piers Morgan's departure w was major news. The way it yeah. happened, etc. it was all done on screen or whatever. So I suppose it, 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 some people feel there's a gap, but then as, as we've discussed, people like Adol Ray and mm. Richard Bailey are there. And look at Have I Got News For You. It's, yes. it, now that is hugely successful in that format. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do at GMB because I genuinely have no idea, but actually there's been something great for us about being able to have a variety of different presenters. And we've had, mm. you know, Martin Lewis, we've had um, Rob Rinder, we've had Ed Balls, Alistair Campbell, um, Richard Bacon. Can you ever see it being presented by two women? Have we reached that point? I think, Does it have to know, be I a man we, and a we woman? Have, we do have two women. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, um, quite often we'll have Charlotte Hawkins and yeah. Ranveer Singh, or we'll have Kate Garraway and Charlotte. We do have, um, you know, on occasion two women. I, are you asking whether we'll ever have per, two permanent women? Yeah. Absolutely, I can see that happening. Yeah. But I don't know, um, that's not me saying again that it is going to happen. No, but, but no, it's, it's I interesting to see. I mean, but it is interesting because it's that whole, you know, breakfast television is traditionally a man and a woman. Yes. And in some ways I think television is such a funny world because it has evolved less than perhaps other parts of society. I find it sometimes weird that we, and I'm not talking about GMB particularly actually, but on television, you know, you still see men wearing suits and ties and women, you know, very dressed up in the way that you don't walking around London anymore. No. Um, no. but, but that format, I mean, I remember being very little watching the very first episode in 1983 of Breakfast Time on mm. the BBC. It got in just before TV AM and it was a middle-aged man with uh, an attractive younger woman and it was very almost cliched and, mm. and up to a point it's trying to break out of those cliches. Yeah. And people find that safe, I think, but, I don't, mm. but we, we definitely don't do that anymore. I mean, that yes. has changed. Um, but you're right, most of the time it's presented by a man and a woman. Although, you know, for us, our main presenter is Susanna Reid because she is the one who was on yeah. um, Monday to Thursday yes. um, with a variety of gentlemen. Yeah. Um, and she is the kind of, you know, mainstay of our show. Yes, uh, and, and came across 
from the BBC. Did, did the Strictly route as well. Are we mm. going to see you in Strictly at any point? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't believe that entirely. Uh, we, we'll no see. We'll see. Um, I, I think one of the things for Good Morning Britain to kind of uh, always be considered is um, that there could be quite a, a left field question. If you're going to go on with someone like a, a Richard Maidley, mm. um, what would you say to somebody who's preparing for an interview on GMB mm. and they're going, OK, I kind of know what Dan Walker might have asked mm. me. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about mm. what I'm going to be asked on GMB. Um, what would your advice be to somebody who is preparing to appear on the programme? I think definitely don't be nervous because all our presenters are um, wonderfully welcoming and um, you know, thoughtful interviewers who genuinely want um, I sound like I'm being a media trainer now, but you know the point of the interview is to make great television. And unless you are a cabinet minister, in which case, you know, I think that's an entirely different story. Mm -hmm. And it will be, by definition, often a very confrontational interview. I think, you know, most of the time, what we want to do is create an interesting interview. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think you need to be nervous, but um, go in there, you know, relaxed about what whichever way it may turn. And you know, I think you're right that we like to, you know, unexpected moments may happen, but I don't think we go out of our way to kind of, to do that. I don't, we, we don't try to trip up our guests or ask them things they're not mm. expecting. We just like things to kind of go the way they go in an organic way. What would your suggestion be to somebody who had the option of doing a remote interview mm. as opposed to oh, a no, face-to-face? Always face, come into the studio. Always come. But yeah. are you wanting people in the studio? Because actually, We are now, actually, yeah. Joe's saying, does the increased online guest situation make a difference? Now we can be there in person and not on screens mm. or whatever. Could we see more of that? More, you're trying to get people back into the studio. Yeah, no, we love people in the studio. I mean, it has been amazing being able to have people um, virtually, especially for news gathering, because you know I used to spend an entire day going out to get two interviews, you know, schlepping around London with a camera crew driving through central London or whatever, and now I can get, you know, five done in an hour. Yes. Um, you know, when we're talking about a 20-second clip for a news bulletin, then it's it, it's literally changed my life and yeah. is completely game-changing. But for guests for the show, um, and again, it's great to be able to... I was interviewing someone the other day, and they said, oh, I'm, I'm at a conference in um, Zimbabwe, but which was absolutely nothing to do with the story, but it didn't make any difference. And of course, we wouldn't have been able to interview them. Yes. Um, um, a couple of years ago without huge expense because for some reason I think we as viewers weren't ready to accept people appearing from their living rooms <laughs> on our TVs. Yes. And now we are. But there's something about being in the studio with somebody I think generally I would say it is a better interview. It, it makes it easier for the person being interviewed. Yeah but and I think it's just it's just a nicer experience all round. Mm. And, you know, you're talking about expecting the unexpected and so on, but I think you have much more of a, more of a rapport with someone when you're there with them. And you can also say, speak to them in the ad break beforehand and say, oh, you know, by the way, I really want to talk about this or I really don't want to talk about this. Mm. How was the pandemic for Good Morning Britain? Because I actually felt, I mean, we, we did a lot of research mm. here at Broadcast Revolution and we were finding that actually it was television and programmes like your own that were seeing a big surge in audience because mm. people needed you, mm. they needed information, mm. they needed a friend, they were often mm. not working in the office, so actually, mm. um, how, is, how was it for GMB? I mean, I imagine it incredibly challenging, but mm. also a, a great opportunity mm. too. Well, I missed the beginning of it because I was on maternity leave. Um, so I wasn't there, you know, when it kicked off, and I think that was when it was actually, you know, at times, if you think back to it, quite frightening for anybody who was having to go into work. Um, because we didn't really know what was happening, did we? And mm. my sense from my colleagues was that they felt a huge sense of responsibility, as you say, to um, make sure that people had all the information they need. And also, you were talking about Piers Morgan holding the government to account mm. over how they were handling the coronavirus pandemic, which, you know, in some, some circumstances was great and in other circumstances wasn't. And yeah. we had a huge responsibility on that front as well to um, ask those questions. And I think everybody, every journalist who worked at that time felt, I, certainly for the first time in my journalistic career, a real um, sense of why we wanted to do the job. Because I think we all went in it to kind of feel like we were, um, you know. Well, we, we were kind of seen as, we were people who were allowed to travel and allowed to yeah. go into work in ways that sometimes, I was producing Radio 4's phone in at the time, and you thought, actually, this is a real lifeline for some people. Yeah, exactly. And I think, 
most journalists went into the job to try to do something important, I suppose. Yeah. And I know the journalists love to tell themselves this, and often yes. it's just not true, is it? But during those months, I genuinely felt, you know, we're doing something that was was really important, um, and that came with a lot of responsibility. Well, um, Kate, Kate Garraway, uh, surely a linchpin, yeah. is somebody whose whose personal life has been affected with the her mm. partner's chronic ill mm. health post COVID, uh, and again, that's been a moment where GMB has been able to put the spotlight on that. Mm. Um, yeah, and she's an incredible woman. Uh, she is, and, and, and a great radio presenter. I, I worked with her at Five Live, and she was brilliant. And I think maybe you know this has raised her profile in a very welcome way, uh, in terms of raising a profile, but in the most unwelcome mm. way in terms of the context mm. of it. Um, another question here for you, coming in again via our Twitter account at Broadcast Revo. I work for a charity that did put a celebrity up for a short story, which talked about our work on GMB this year, which was great. But could we still pitch ideas without a celebrity? perhaps if we had a strong case study or a non-famous person. Yeah, of course. And I think, again, when I'm talking about what's going to make it on GMB, I have to make the distinction between what might make it into our news bulletins and what might make it into the kind of the broader part of our program where the presenters are interviewing guests. And in our news bulletins, we will often do a story driven by a non-celebrity case study, um, you know, that's come from a charity or whatever. And, you know, that that isn't the point where we would be saying we need a celebrity to talk about it. And in fact, sometimes we, we, we don't want a celebrity to talk about it because I think, um, you know, when it's, when it's a, um, a news story, you feel like you want to hear from people who are genuinely experiencing mm. whatever it is, don't you? Um, so I think, yeah, it's important to make that distinction. And, and sometimes the best pictures might be, look, for news, I could offer you um, the chief executive of, of, of the charity and a case study and here's some filming we've got, you know, with our scientists and here's somewhere you could film um, with a case study. And, and by the way, um, our patron is Emma Thompson and she could be interviewed by the presenters. And then you've got that, that whole, the full package and then we can kind of pick the elements we'll that we want. We'll have a bit of that, bit of that, bit yeah. of that. So actually, there we go. That's actually one thing I wanted to ask you is there you are, you've been a producer, you've been sat there in the middle of the night. The, the, the various elements that you want at your disposal. Yeah. So a, a, a real cross section in terms of voices speaking on the subject matter, mm. maybe some strong research. Um, and pictures. I was going to say B-roll, any sort of Yeah, B-roll is great for us. I mean, you know, obviously with the best role in the world, we would love to come and film things ourselves, but yeah. our resources are limited um, and as they are for everybody. And B-roll is, you know, we, we're not always going to use it, but, uh, and, and again, we have to treat it with the same kind of um, journalistic rigour as we do a branded survey in that we, you know, we have to check that we're happy with the quality and, and obviously we always... Um, uh, signpost that it has come from somebody else but b-roll is great uh, but also just um, thinking about if you're going to pitch to television you've got to think about what it's going to look like on television and I've lost yep. count of the number of times where I've been given a really good story but then I've called up the press office and said you know where are the pictures of this or where can we film yeah. and oh no sorry that thing isn't open today or that person's not available today or um, you know, they, they don't really want to be filmed in their home, so... Um, so really get your ducks in a row. Everything so. should be on offer for well, you. I knew, you know, I know, obviously, we as journalists need to do the work as well, but often, you know, if some, something's being um, dealt with the day before, which is the way we work, if I'm honest with news, we're going to... If, if there's a story on for Tuesday, we're going to film it on Monday. Mm. And the reporter might not start until midday. And so what's really helpful is if we can... The conversation's been had the day before and everything's ready to go. Right, right. So but the main thing is just to think about what it's going to look like. I think that's such a key thing, and I know it sounds really obvious, but what is it actually going to look like yes. on television? What can we see? Because if we can't see anything, we're not going to do it. And for the person who is contributing remotely, what advice would you give them in terms of backdrop and frame? Yeah, and you know what, we are, what, I mean, less so now, but during the pandemic, we were asking a lot of our quote-unquote case studies to film stuff for us. We would say, you know, can you get your partner to just take a few shots of you on your computer or out on a walk? Okay. And we would talk them through the basics of shooting a few GVs, you know, put your phone on landscape mode. Can you just do, you know, one and then go a bit closer and do a close up shot? Then can you have them walk through the frame? Wow. Yeah. I mean, and you, it, you would be amazed that some of the brilliant stuff that we would get sent when we asked for that. Well, that, that's the incredible thing with the, with the smartphone yeah. that I'm using to kind of put questions yeah. to you is, is, is the capability of it is, is, is staggering. I mean, citizen journalism, how much is that going to have a place, do you think, on, on GMB? Hugely so. Really? And a breaking news story. I mean, this is where it gets difficult, doesn't it? Because, again, 
we have to be very careful about what we put on air. And of yeah. course, we have to make sure that everything is verified. And you know, as you well know, we live in an age of disinformation, misinformation. And during the Ukraine, the start of the Ukraine war, I was working a lot overnight, and we were getting in obviously a lot of pictures, and we would have to assess whether it was um, legitimate, I suppose. Yes. And sometimes, you know, quite short notice. Um, but with a breaking news story, then that we get a lot of our images and information from social media. I mean, that, I remember Jon Snow talking about the, the, the role for Channel 4 News, he was saying, that one of the most important roles is, is to be that filter. Yeah. To actually, uh, that's hard to do in the it's middle really of the night. It's really hard. It's hard to do with breaking news. I mean, but that, yeah. that's now a really major factor, is it's it, you know, wiping out the factor. fake news? Yeah, and also just being, you know, being really responsible with it. So especially when you've got something, you know, like that Las Vegas shooting, for example, that I remember really vividly because I was on that night when there's a huge... Um, amount of information coming in and pictures and audio and video and all sorts coming in on Twitter and you're really conscious that you know actually because it was a US story there wouldn't probably be many people watching GMB who would potentially have people caught up in it but uh, especially with something happening in this country obviously we have a huge responsibility to make sure that we're reporting it accurately and we're not inadvertently identifying people who Who's, mm. who may be caught up in it, whose relatives didn't know. Mm. And, you know, it's a, a huge part of our job. Um, but also, with a breaking news story, we're really aware of the fact that people want the latest information and they want the pictures and they want to see what's going on. Yes. Um, and it's a massive part of our job, especially with rolling news and breaking news overnight. And Ukraine has been a real eye-opener into that, actually. I, I think what's fascinating with, with Ukraine is, 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 is how much it dominated the news agenda mm. when, it, when it happened. But... One sense is it's going to be quite a long-running mm. conflict. Uh, how do you balance that? Because obviously, I imagine at the start of the Ukraine conflict, that was pretty much 100% yeah. of your content. At, at what point do you say, okay, we, we need to actually bring more mm. material, other stories back into a mm. program? It, it's a very difficult balance. It's a really difficult balance, and I think it very much depends what the stories are. But do you want hard news stories at that point, or do you actually want the reverse? Do you want the escape? Do you want the lighter, fluffier uh, stories both. to be able to move things on? Sometimes the fluffiness can can feel jarring. Yes. Um, but I think that GMB does. I mean, that is the unique thing about breakfast television, isn't it? I mean, we will often have Ukraine, and then we will have to do a gear change to something. Yes. You know, completely. It's the different. art of the presenter. That's our present exactly. Our presenters yes. are wonderful, and also I think we understand and accept that if you want rolling news on Ukraine, you're not watching Good Morning Britain. So we have to think about what our audience want at the time, and of course they want to know what's going on in Ukraine, but I don't think that that's exclusively what they're tuning in for. So I think we're very much trying to think about our audience and what they want. And I also think, like I said, it depends what other stories are around. And obviously Ukraine then, after the Ukraine war happened, then the cost of living here started to bite, in part mm. because of the war in Ukraine. And so there was also a sense there that, yes, there's, this, there's stuff going on in Ukraine, which we absolutely have to reflect, but we have to acknowledge the fact that people here are really suffering too, in a completely different way. You say that's the dominant domestic story of the moment. Absolutely. And cost of living. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, breakfast television, BBC Breakfast, coming from Salford. Um, mm. You're seeing Channel 4 News shifting a lot of people mm. up to Leeds. Um, there is... Good Morning Britain, you know, based in London. Mm. How important is it for your programme to reflect the entire United Kingdom? Oh, very important. So actually, case studies, it, there's an advantage to offering people from outside of the South yeah. East. Again, you know, logistics are always difficult. And, mm. you know, naturally we have more resources in London because we're based in London. But we have teams and crews and all sorts based all over the country. And you're right, we welcome things from other parts of the country because we don't want to, uh, you know, just report what's happening in London. Mm -hmm. And we want people to all over the country to feel they're represented on our programme. Um, we're fast running out of time. I wanted to ask you uh, one question, which is you've been at ITV Breakfast in three different guises, but you've been there for over a decade. Mm. What do you think has been the finest hour for that particular programme, that particular moment where it really shone out as, you, you came off the air and you went, we did a really great job there. Mm. Um, I mean, again, I wasn't there the morning of the Grenfell fire, but um, I watched it from home and I thought that the team did a really incredible job with an, an, such a devastating, harrowing story and balancing people's need to know what was going on with, as I said before, being respectful 
and reporting it fairly and accurately. Um, and I think we all came, everybody came off air that day feeling very um, drained by it. Of course, not in any way um, like the people who are actually involved in it, but it was a moment where I think we felt like we did it justice, which mm. obviously is a really difficult thing to do. And we feel we take it very seriously and is very important to us. I mean, the other thing is just, I think the pandemic, I think that, um, you know, you mentioned Kate Garraway, but her personal experience mm. of the coronavirus pandemic, I think has become a real symbol for lots of people's experience of it. You know, maybe not to that extreme, but lots of people have seen their lives turned upside down by it. And her kind of as an emblem of that, and also her strength and the way that she has dealt with that and the way that she has tried to help other people with that, I think has been a real um, shining light in all of it. Mm. And has done, I think, what GMB likes to do, which is, you know, put a face onto things make it feel um, real and make it feel accessible mm. and make it feel like we're on your side helping or you know trying to hold people to account um, and that we're listening so I mean I'm a newsy person so I'm always going to pick news things probably other people might say oh we did a great interview with Mariah Carey or whatever <laughs> <laughs> but I always uh, it's the news ones that I remember yes absolutely uh, a fascinating new role and good luck mm. with it uh, I think there's going to be plenty of holding account interviews going forward for mm. you in, in particular. Uh, my thanks to our guest, Louisa James, for being with us today. Uh, our next event, we're actually going to be uh, aiming to be in Manchester again once more, uh, this time with the new editor of the BBC's Central News Service. Now, that's the provider of audio content uh, and national level guests to all of the BBC's local radio stations. Louisa and I still really rate BBC Local Radio. It has a very important role to play. Uh, and of course, many local radio stations have 200, 250,000 listeners. So this is a way that you can try and learn a bit more perhaps about local radio, what content can get on there. Uh, and interesting to hear about the demographic as well. Who's listening to BBC Local Radio now? We're hoping to do that. Also have a regional ITV voice uh, alongside us there at that Manchester event. We'll uh, send you all details as soon as that particular event is finalised. We'll hopefully be, be doing that sometime in July. In the meantime, there's a poll on your screen. I hope it's popping up around now. If you've been kind enough to fill it in, it really does help us tailoring events that hopefully you'll enjoy all the more going forward. But in the meantime, from Louisa and myself, thank you very much for watching.